supposed to be a McConnell double feature or death by disembodied voice twice, I've been having some technical difficulties, so the second part of this may not come by podcast. At any rate, we've been looking for an opportunity to talk more about historical reasoning skills and especially how to evaluate and make cause-effect arguments. I suggested to Ms. Jacobs and Mr. Hauser that I try my hand at illustrating the four ECB historical reasoning skills using the Black Death as an example. Always a cheerful subject for movie day, right? Well, my co-conspirators agreed, but Ms. Jacob also mentioned that we need to cover the European High Middle Ages at our usual warp speed. Uh, Maybe, she suggested, I could do this by talking about churches and medieval art. Well, some of you know all too well that I can talk about churches in mind-numbing detail and at mind-numbing length, but since the College Board isn't going to ask you to name eight parts of a Gothic church or to describe the difference between Romanesque and Gothic arches, we get to keep things simple. Let's start with feudalism in a work that dropped out of the art history curriculum but used to be a College Board favorite. This calendar page from a book of hours or daily prayer book was created for the younger brother of the King of France. The date puts it in the early Renaissance, but the subject matter is really the feudal world where territories, often quite small, were ruled by powerful nobles, where kings for the most part were quite weak, and where the economic and social gulf between lords and peasants was huge and almost never breached. So what information do we pick up about the life of the nobility from this artwork? Well, we see nobles dressed in rich, sumptuous fabrics, probably elegant Italian or Flemish wool, since this is January. Much of Europe's economic recovery was driven by the wool trade centered in northern Italy and Flanders. We see armored knights in the background. And of course, the nobility's power was rooted first and foremost in their ability to protect and hold the countryside, as well as to extract wealth from the agricultural products that peasants would grow. Their power base was the fortified castle. What's going to be the problem with that, by the way? And very soon, if you don't think of the answer, no worries, it's coming soon. Only six months of the Book of Hours calendar were devoted to the nobility. The other months showed scenes from the life of peasants. So what do we learn? It was a harsh life, exposed to the elements. Peasants lived with their animals, helped keep everyone warm, if not exactly sweet-smelling. But we also see at least one sign of the agricultural revolution that is boosting food production and population throughout Western Europe. And what is that sign? It's a horse collar. Horses could pull the new, heavier plows faster than oxen. And by the way, that is not a plow in the painting. Uh, They could also work a couple of hours more a day. After 1,000 or so CE, European peasants also developed new crops, such as beans. They rotated the crops more efficiently through three fields, and they cleared a whole lot more forest and swampland. More people meant more demand for food. More food meant more production of people. We have our feedback cycle again. We're going to talk about what happens in the miserable 14th century, and it's not just the plague. But for now, note the very impressive population growth between 1000 and 1300 CE. In some places, the change was even more dramatic. The population of England, for example, is thought to have almost quintupled in the Romanesque era, from around 1 million to around 5 million people. In addition to the food population feedback cycle, Europe got a break from the plague. Remember, there had been earlier bouts, especially in the reign of Justinian. The Viking raids slowed way down in this period, and one group of Viking invaders, the Normans, settled in Western Europe and multiplied fruitfully. Norman England and Sicily actually broke from the pattern of weak kings and strong nobles. Both established efficient centralized regimes. So here's a busy but very informative graph from an economics professor at UC Berkeley. What does this tell us about developments between, say, 1000 and 1300? Basically, the period that we call Romanesque and Gothic in art history. Well, the number of people living in towns and cities almost doubled. Europe acquired a new kind of educational institution, the university, and the number of books increased fourfold. Remember, these were still hand-copied books. No printing press yet. Together, these elements began to transform feudalism. 
At the end of the Roman Empire, urban centers had lost most of their population or disappeared altogether. Now medieval Europeans were flocking to towns. For one thing, any serf who could manage to stay in town for one year and a day without getting caught by his lord could become a freeman. Money also returned to the economy in this period. People did not just barter for goods, and in fact, not only was coinage in circulation, but new financial instruments, uh, such as um, orders for goods that could be that could be accounted for at a bank, just appeared at this time. As more town dwellers had money to build churches, craft guilds began to compete with monasteries as producers of religious art. And an important part of the story was pilgrimage. So let's turn to the first part of an excellent video on Romanesque cathedrals. My apologies to art historians. You've seen this before, but it was a year ago. And the good news is no need to worry about the scary floor plan any longer. Note the massive size of this pilgrimage church and the recovery of Roman architectural techniques, such as arches and barrel vaults. Also note the church design evolved to address the needs of these pilgrimages. So you see those pinkish orange radiating chapels and the blue ambulatory. The radiating chapels held relics and the ambulatory made it possible for pilgrims to get to the relics without disturbing the monks during their many services. And that brings me to monasticism, which was another great force transforming Western Christianity. So let's hear another brief clip from our art historian. Just one last point about Romanesque pilgrimage churches before we rush on. Pilgrims almost always entered a door decorated with deliciously gruesome depictions of the Last Judgment and the fate they were trying to avoid by traveling the pilgrim's path. This was not one of our required works, art historians, but it's probably my personal favorite. And here we see the Archangel Michael and the devil weighing souls to see who gets to get into heaven and who gets to stay in hell. I love those wonderful scary hands reaching down to pluck a hapless sinner to heaven, to hell, we're not sure. Notice too that the devil seems to be cheating by pulling on the scales. So to recap, in the age of pilgrimages, uh, the first part of what would be called the High Middle Ages, uh, we saw Europe emerge from the turn of the millennium, overjoyed that the world had not ended, relieved that the Viking and Magyar raids, as well as the plague, seemed to be subsiding, and further affirmed in their faith and their confidence as Christian Spaniards slowly won the Iberian Peninsula back from its Muslim rulers. Towns were recovering, and an energized by a papal plea, Western Europeans set out on a series of crusades. The crusades did not recapture the Holy Land for very long, but they did bring new goods and fresh ideas back with the crusaders. In our next era, the Gothic period in art history, or the higher High Middle Ages, as historians more often describe it, Western European Christendom became even more prosperous and self-confident, even exuberant. A major church reform movement restored monastic discipline and strengthened the papacy. Towns multiplied and some towns, such as Paris, became major cities. Learning moved beyond monasteries to new urban universities that sought to reconcile Christian revelation with Greek philosophy and logic. A gentle, loving Virgin Mary reigned as Queen of Heaven and offered believers ready access to her son. The final judgment was still waiting in the wings, of course, but Christianity in this new era seemed kinder, kinder, gentler, and more confident of happy endings. So the Church of Saint Denis, which was the home church of the King of France, not in fact a very powerful figure at this point, was the first great Gothic cathedral. So what difference do you see between the Romanesque church on the left and the Gothic church on the right? Let's hear from someone who didn't take art history. And now let's hear from our art historian one last time. Before I leave Gothic art, practically just after I arrived, I want to show you two statues of Mary, both from the early 14th century. On the left is a French Gothic Mary from the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. She's gentle, approachable, feminine. We see a natural body pose 
draping of cloth over a real body, and an interaction between the two figures. All of this points toward Renaissance rediscovery of the classical world. And it shows that the break between the High Middle Ages and the Renaissance, which the Florentines took very seriously, all is new under the sun, wasn't really as sharp a break as they liked to think. But what about that suffering Mary and the dead Christ uh, in the statue from Germany on the right? In part, the differences between the works reflect differences between French and German culture. Uh, German religious art was often more emotional and dramatic. But the suffering Mary and Jesus also point to hints of a world that is beginning to go very, very wrong in a century that was pretty disastrous for Europe. So there was the plague, of course, which killed off as much as half the population, and that's where we're heading next. But Europe was also hit by a, an ecological catastrophe, and not a man-made one, climate change. Cool, wet summers and bitterly cold winters in what was called the Little Ice Age, stunted crops, produced great famine, and left malnourished peasants susceptible to diseases like the plague. Another 14th century tragedy was a schism in the church as the papacy first moved to Avignon in France and then suffered through a period where there were actually competing popes in Avignon and in Rome. Uh, this divide in the church undermined the authority of the pope. Since competing popes had to appeal to political rulers for support, they also couldn't exert their authority over rulers very successfully. So England, for example, supported Roman popes, mostly because they wanted to strike a blow against their enemy France. The French, of course, liked having popes living in Avignon. But ordinary people found the discord in the church, combined with what seemed like the clergy's growing corruption and preoccupation with wealth, uh, disturbing, and eventually this will partly lead to the Protestant Revolution, uh, Reformation. And here we see a painting of Pope Gregory XI returning to Rome in 1476, which ended the schism. It wasn't just tragedy that reshaped the Europe emerging in the 15th century. Inventions and ingenuity made a big difference as well. Back when I taught AP European history at Juan Diego, I told my class on the first day of school that we were beginning the course rather arbitrarily on August 26, 1346. I made them guess, but I'll go ahead and tell you that this is the date of the Battle of Crecy, one of the many battles of the Hundred Years' War between England and France. So. Why would I pick that date as the start of early modern history? I want you to watch a video clip that I used to start off my AP European history class with, and then I'll pose the question again. So, why did I start early modern history with this battle? Well, historians estimate that more than a third of French knights died on that single day, defeated by a bunch of upstart English peasants. As the noted military historian John Keegan noted, warfare after Crecy belonged increasingly to the infantry, which ended the reign of the knights, and for that matter, the horse warrior. Raising and maintaining a large infantry army was expensive, however, and it was a job more easily taken on by large political entities and kings than by nobles with a small fief. Once armament makers figured out how to make cannons and then muskets that could actually hit what they were aimed at, Fortified castles no longer provided much protection either. Uh, by the way, the first really decisive use of gunpowder artillery in battle was when cannons broke down the walls that had protected Constantinople for a thousand years, and the Byzantine Empire was, well, history. And of course, as European explorers and conquerors sailed east and west, they brought with them their mastery of a technology originating in China, acquired and spread by Islamic by Muslim traders, but ultimately harnessed most successfully by the Europeans who used it to conquer the world. Stay tuned. Meanwhile, on to 